Hello and welcome to uh, TFF's 30th anniversary uh, lectures uh, on Peace by Peaceful Means, starting at this moment, four o'clock in the afternoon, Friday, September 11, in Lund, Sweden, and going on tomorrow, we have two sessions today, and going on tomorrow from 10 to 18, Swedish or Central European summertime, as it's called. And we're glad to tell you that you're not alone sitting here. Over Facebook, we have about 175 viewers. And outside that, we know that quite a few people are watching us too. And that's absolutely lovely. It is a way in which we can be happy that modern technology can help us because what we would have liked to do would be to invite anybody to come to a conference or seminar here in Lund. But we all know how that would be taxing on the environment and how expensive it would be for those inviting. So we're looking really much forward to this and I'll keep to just today's program because the program is available on the DACast.com website under the image you're looking at now. It's available on the event on Facebook and you can see exactly when today and tomorrow you want to uh, perhaps uh, watch uh, one of the lectures. We don't expect you to watch them all, but I can tell you they will be interesting. So, uh, <clears throat> today uh, I will be speaking a little bit about the war on terror, which is very topical since this is today, 14 years ago. The attack on New York and Washington took place that has, in a fundamental way, changed the world and how we see the world. And secondly, at five o'clock, that is in one hour from now, we will have five of us, board members and associates, discussing what we think, or hope rather, what we dream the world would be like in 30 years from now, in 2045. And when that kind of imaginative session is over, we want to say cheers to ourselves and that better, future possible world that we are working for because we're not stop, stopping working by 30. 30 is a long time but we still have energy. So this is today's program. It will last uh, about two hours and starts tomorrow at 10. So thank you for being there and let me plunge myself out to the discussion about terrorism and the war on terror. I have been against that since the 12th of September 2001 when it happened and the talk began to be about how to find revenge to the attack. The attack was a horrible thing, it was a criminal act, it was not a declaration of war. There were no soldiers used, no military weapons, there were some box cutters and civilian planes. We know that about three, almost 3,000 people were killed, that in itself is totally unacceptable and very sad and I'd like to pay respect to those who died and their families on this occasion. Of course they think of their loved ones this very day. On the other hand, it is not a big thing in terms of human lives when we think of the fact that at least 21,000 children are dying every day from lacking the most necessary things on earth for their survival. It is not so much when you think of the fact that 3,000 people, roughly the same number of people, are killing each other inside the United States in revolver violence every year, or that 300,000 Americans are dying from obesity every year. So what we can ask is, did we, in the light of history, treat this awful event in a productive or counterproductive way? And we, I mean the Western world, led by the United States and the terror, war on terror. My answer is no, because we know that today roughly 18,000 people are killed in terror per year. These are the la latest figures we have from 2013. How many were killed in terror attacks in 2000 and 2001 before this happened? Well, about four to five hundred 
according to American statistics that later on have stopped being published. This means, and you can count it yourself, that this tragic, tragic event and the war on terror is now killing many, many, many times more people than the original cause of the death, than the terrorist, if we call it that, attack on 9-11-2001. Now, if the purpose was, which we guess it was, or can play with the assumption that it was, we said, yeah, the idea was to make the war on terror uh, successful and thereby get rid of terror, this is an utter failure. There's no way in which one can legitimate that the result 14 years later is many, many times bigger, from 400 killed per year to 18,000. So perhaps it's time to have an honest intellectual, moral discussion about what are we doing wrong? Why do we see terrorism grow? We also see, I would add, a inflation in the use of the word. Everything is called terrorism nowadays. Charlie Hebdo was terrorism. Two people dead in Copenhagen was terrorism. I have no memory that when Olaf Palme or Martin Luther King or John F. Kennedy was killed, that we talked about terrorism. We talked about criminality. So let's be careful with how we throw around the word. But let me now just say, what is terrorism? What could terrorism be? Because there are tons of definitions of it. First of all, it's a political act, the purpose of which is to instill fear it's a surprising, appalling, disgusting, non-legal act to achieve a political purpose. But the essential thing that distinguishes it from warfare is that it deliberately hits innocent people. That is the purpose of it, such as children in a school bus, bus, bus or people going to a theater or sitting in a cafe. People who are not involved in the conflict, people who are not guilty of what happens in the conflict. So. We can say that based on that definition, which I think holds water, we have two types of terrorism. We have private small group terrorism, and that's the one the media and the politicians are interested in talking about, such as ISIS, Daesh, such as earlier, Bader Meinhof, Oda Armee Fraktion, such as individuals who do terrible things inside warfare. These are small groups, still groups, but small. And the other type of terrorism is state terrorism. And that's the one we never talk about. And that's the one for very good reasons that governments don't talk about. That is mass killing of people by bombs from the air. Weapons used that cannot but be hitting innocent civilians. Now we know that warfare is very difficult to fight without killing some. But we know also that statistics over time tell us that more and more civilians out of everyone, of all killed in wars, are civilians. Secondly, I mean, if you take sanctions, sanctions is a weapon that we know from history kills innocent civilians, or at least harm their lives, make lives impossible, takes away medicine, bread, and whatever from people, such as in Iraq. Please remember that Iraq has suffered to the extent of about one million people thanks to the war, the invasion, the occupation, and the terrorists, the, the um, sanctions on the country. More people died because of the sanctions than during the war, or the military affairs. So, the largest type, the worst type of terrorism today is the state terrorism that we once upon a time, those of us who are old enough, remember. It was called the balance of terror. And that was an appropriate word. It was East and West, predominantly in the old Cold War, whose idea was that I can kill most of your people on the other side, but I know also I cannot kill everyone because you will have nuclear weapons left on your submarines, under your wings of the airplanes, and in your silos, and therefore I must recognize that a number of million of pe people on my side will be killed in a second strike. It was called mutually assured destruction, uh, for short, MAD, and it was MAD. So those countries which have nuclear weapons, who have built nuclear weapons into their arsenals and their doctrines for use, such as the United States, unfortunately, 
and being also the first to use nuclear weapons against the conventional attack if deemed necessary, are terrorist states. And it's very unfortunate that we don't talk about that much, potentially much larger terror terrorism that could hit millions of people if we have a nuclear accident or we have a mad person who decides, for instance, losing a game or a battle or an empire somewhere, would say, okay, let, let us go down with a bang rather than a whimper. So, I'd like to have a broader, suggest that we have a broader discussion about what terrorism is and not st staring ourselves blind on ISIS and other relatively small phenomena, although they are growing. By the way, ISIS is a product of the American occupation of Iraq. We have ourselves to thank for this. So, maybe we should start talking about these issues in a different way. And we should also observe that that war against terror has basically had more negative effects on our own societies. And that was what some of the terrorists have said was their interest, namely to show that the, that the, the, the top layer of democracy and decency and all that of the Western world was very thin. What we've seen the last 14 years is a tremendous growth of everything surveillance, of your letters, of your faxes, of your telephones, where you go in the world, where you use your credit card, etc., etc., etc. There is virtually no private space left. Private freedom, privacy is almost disappearing, and people seem to be able to find it okay. Uh, some even saying, well, we happen to be on television or on camera all the time. In my generation, we found it appalling if we were monitored in the streets for no good reasons. That means a tremendous control and surveillance society way beyond what poor George Orwell once uh, talked about. And the other one that we are fighting against is the problem of militarism. Militarism in the wake of terrorism or the terror, war on terror. That militarism is today rampant in the sense that while the world's governments give the United Nations about $30 billion for all its purposes and organizations and all the good things the United Nations does, they spend 17 to $1,800 billion on their defense budgets, or what I would call the war budgets. This means that the resources in this world are totally wrongly distributed. We need a reallocation of resources and a new way of thinking, which is in accordance with the Article 1 of the UN Charter norm, namely, and that is the title of our lectures today, peace shall be established by peaceful means. Friends, this is what your government has signed. Why don't we do it? Chapter 7 in the UN Charter says very clearly that this is the last resort when everything else has been tried should be violence under the military leadership of the UN. Why don't we do it? Why don't you protest when your governments use violence as the first resort? I've done it for all the years I've been a Danish citizen when I see my own country since 99 having participated in five useless wars and made Denmark a hated country in many corners of the world because of this. Now NATO is the main culprit here because it spends 60% of the world's military expenditures and it's also the main holders of the nuclear weapons and the main interventionists since 1945. I predict that there will be a very clear fork in the road the next 20 years. It will be between those who support that system and those who seek alternatives. And it will look like the people who tried to run away from Stasi and the failure of the communist system in the 80s and those who stuck with it far too long. It is time to think new thoughts. It's time to find out how much more we owe to the world instead of lecturing and teaching and bombing the world. So, I think uh, what we're up against is a reckless use of violent means in the names of fighting terrorism. We have it in the Middle East where country after country historically has been destroyed by the West and we have it 
the over-militarization in the midst of Europe now with the Ukraine crisis, where terrorism is also an element. I believe that what we have to do, and you might find that naive, but I find everything else more naive, we need to understand why people become terrorists. What motivates them? We need some psychologists. We need some social psychologists. We need some anthropologists. We need some who knows other cultures. And we have to, at some point, indirectly, secretly, or officially, at some point, to talk with those whom we call terrorists. There's no way you can bomb this problem away till it doesn't exist, unless you want to destroy the whole world on the way to that terrorism-free world. The terrorism-free world is only possible if, at some point, we use dialogue, and even, perhaps, an apology for some of the major violence that we have created in the Western world over the rest of the world. Please observe that one of the first chapters of words in Bin Laden's, not a person I support, but worth reading, book about it was to point out how the West has used and done terrible things and terroristic things in, this, in the Far East. His book started out with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki we have learned absolutely nothing from and from which the United States has never apologized. So, media and politics perhaps could do it differently in the future. Perhaps researchers could do it differently in the future. And if governments cannot find out how to do dialogue, negotiations and meet these people, some of us will have to try to do it at some point in the future because as it is now, it cannot go on. It is possible to talk with human beings. I've talked with enough war criminals myself and former Yugoslavia and elsewhere to know that even those people are human beings. And they have ideas and they have wishes and they have fears like you and me. And that's why they use this, of course, wrong way of handling it. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I tried to give the bigger picture around the war on terror that basically all mainstream parties and mainstream of media swallow raw and think we have chosen the right way to combat. We haven't. It's only one dot in a much larger picture of militarism, arrogance, and absurd misuse of the world's resources. Let's change it when you make people happy. When you treat people in a decent way, they don't become terrorists. Because you don't become terrorists, do you? So why do other people become terrorists? They're probably human beings like you and me. Thank you very much. Do we have some immediate questions? Or comments? Or is there, by the way, something on Facebook? Where is uh, the monitor of Facebook? Because there you can make comments. You cannot do that on the darkhouse.com page, but you can do it um, on Facebook, on the big, uh, where it's broadcast now. But if there is no questions, it's fine. I hope that what I said can deal, lead to some discussions where you are. You're sitting in about 50 different countries all over the world. You're all affected by it. And you're always welcome to send a, a message, your views, to tff at transnational.org or go to our website www.transnational.org where you will find much more, particularly on the blog written by TFF Associates about terrorism and how we think it should be fought. Because of course we should fight terrorism, it's not a good idea to fuse terrorism, but it has to be done in a different way. And so at five o'clock, that is about 39 minutes from now, we will have an imaginative, totally unrealistic, you know, real politics is the worst thing we have because it's not realistic, imaginative session about how the five of us who are present here in Lowe today would like to hope and see and share with you why we keep on doing what we do, namely a positive vision, a pro-peace vision. We are not a peace organization, we are not peace researchers who just sit and criticize the military and the weapons, we are talking about solutions. We do criticize, but we do solutions too. So you're welcome. Uh, there's a little break now, uh, up to five o'clock Central European summertime. And then see you there. And it's going to be uplifting, I can promise you. Thank you so much.